Well, okay. I want to say welcome to everyone who is watching. Uh, I want to invite you to stand, put your Bible over your head, and let's ask God to empower our time in his word. Lord, we thank you that this is not just a book. This is the bread of life. Thank you that this is a lamp into our feet, a light into our path, and we don't have to walk in darkness. But as children of the light, we can walk in the light, even in the darkest of times. Thank you, God. Teach us by your Holy Spirit tonight. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, well, wherever you're at, you may be seated if you are standing. Let's jump right in. I have a ton to say. Uh, last week, we started a three-week mini sermon series called The Enemy at the End. We've already been talking about spiritual warfare, about how we have an enemy, the devil, Satan, who's working around the clock to destroy Christians. But this series is meant to bring attention to what the enemy's role will be in the end, in the end times. And then some of the word, some of the ways that the word says he's going to bring his destruction and then how we can be aware we can be aware of these things as people with eyes wide open. I want you to go back and watch the last sermon. Uh, in short, we talked about how in Ephesians chapter 6, Paul says that we need to take up the full armor of God so that we will be able to resist in the evil day. Now, the evil day is most likely not going to be one specific day when all of our worst nightmares come true. Okay, This is going to be a season, and things are going to begin taking shape over time. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, Paul says now about the times and the seasons, and he goes on and he says it's going to be while people are saying peace and safety. I believe this is one of the most important clues in understanding the enemy's strategy. We don't and won't know and, and really can't know all the things that are going to happen in the end times, right? The future work of the enemy, we're not going to know every little detail. But there are plenty of things that will take place that we will be able to see, that we will be able to discern and understand. And I believe a lot of it is going to be in the realm of while people are saying, while people are crying out, peace and safety. Okay, but let's start tonight by asking this question. Who are the people saying peace and safety. I mean, we know that there's going to be people promising us peace and safety, right? But are the people not also us? Are we not also people saying we want peace and safety? Provide for us peace and safety. Bring back peace and safety, Yes, the answer is yes. We are just as much those people saying peace and safety. And you know, some of the enemy's most strategic moves will be while people are saying peace and safety. And I believe that the church really needs to talk about this and begin preparing our hearts and minds to really be in the right place in all this. Otherwise, we're going to find ourselves in a bad place. We're going to find ourselves in a place where we're like, how did we even ever get here? How did we get to this place? Last week, I talked about peace and how really the only sure way of obtaining peace is to go for the gospel. Ephesians chapter 6, Paul even associates the shoes we wear in spiritual battle with the gospel of peace. Okay, but tonight I want to talk about safety. We talked about peace. Tonight I want to talk about safety. You want to make a little side note somewhere if you're taking notes, right? Safety. I want you to um, close your eyes, okay? Bear with me here. But wherever you're at, just, just close your eyes so that you can focus and, and visualize. And ask this question, okay? Finish this sentence, I feel safest when, and fill in the blank, I feel safest when, seriously, take a moment and consider that sentence. I feel safest when, this may be the most significant 
end times question we could ever ask. Why? Because our personal sense of safety is one of Satan's most effective snares. In fact, that's my, my sermon in a sentence tonight. This whole sermon in one sentence. Our personal sense of safety is one of Satan's most effective snares. And if you want a title for this sermon, write down, Safety is not our Savior. Write that down. Okay, so ask yourself that question. I feel safest when? Most secure when? When what? Everyone has their idea of what safety looks like. Some of you are going to close your eyes and you're going to see this big, strong door with multiple locks because a secure home feels safe to you. Others immediately saw your, your, your gun cabinet. Some of you literally went down and felt and make sure that you had your gun on your hip because you feel safest when you're packing, <laughs> right? Maybe you saw your garden and chickens and all the non-perishable food items that you have stored away in your pantry because being prepped for the end of the world feels safe to you. Living off grid feels safe to you. Maybe you saw uh, solar panels because not having power for iPads <laughs> brings you mental distress, right? Safety looks different for everyone. It always has. I wouldn't want to be a Jedi without my lightsaber, right? In fact, um, I had a dream the night before the very first week of all this where I had to preach to an empty room, okay? The night before, I had a dream, right, right, um, right at the beginning of all this, and I almost shared it in that week's sermon, but I, at the last minute, I decided not to because I kind of looked like a doofus in this dream, but I had written it down, and I'm just going to read you that dream. Our people gathered together in our youth room, which is our old chapel in the other building. And everyone was moving slowly with caution as if trying to avoid landmines or something. And yet there were smiles on your faces as though you were at the very same time so excited to be together. That room is loud and echoey and the drums were really loud in worship and everything seemed different and awkward, but good. When it was time for me to preach, I went to the front of the room and I whipped out a lightsaber and started jumping around the room. But my jumps were like force jumps, if you've ever seen Star Wars and how the Jedis can do cool stuff. Okay, my jumps were like force jumps. And I would jump, I was able to go all the way up to the top of the ceiling and hang in the air and come back down. And I was jumping all the way around the room because I was able to get all the way up to the ceiling and back down. And everyone was like, whoa, with their eyes wide open. But there was a strong sense of excitement. Now, what does that dream mean? I have no idea. If you think you know what it means, feel free to chime in on the chat or send me an email or something. But what I do know is that the coronavirus has given us some interesting options to put on the I feel safe when list. I feel safe when world health is under control. I'll feel safe when everyone is wearing a mask and gloves. I'll feel safe when everyone I know has been vaccinated for COVID-19. And think about the things that we have thought. I mean, bear with me here. Think about the things that have gone through our mind, things that we have never thought before, ways that we have planned and strategized to ensure our safety, things we've said we will do, things that we've said we will no longer do, things that we will not participate in. I'm only going to eat at this type of restaurant from now. Well, I'm just going to have to start working out from home. It's not even safe to go to church. I'm just going to stream church from now on. Even conversations with certain people. It's like, I can't even talk to them about this. I can't talk to them about anything 
people that you've decided you can't or won't even talk to because of what they may think or how they may react about whatever, <laughs> where the world's at or, or whatever. So for you, even a conversation with someone doesn't feel safe. Now, please hear me. There's nothing wrong with wanting to feel safe. It's like a natural human instinct given to us by God himself. Why? Because God wants our personal sense of safety to come from him and him alone. He is our salvation, right? Proverbs 18, verse 10 and 11, specifically 10 here. The name of the Lord is a strong tower and the righteous run to it and are safe. That's why our personal sense of safety is one of Satan's most effective snares. You know, in Proverbs chapter 29, verse 25, it says that the fear of man brings a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord shall be safe. Okay, so tonight I have three things I want you to write down and consider. And the first one is this. Fear is the opposite of faith. Now, I know that there's some people that think, well, that's, that's theologically wrong. That's not theologically true, but it's absolutely true. I can, a pers I can personally attest that that is a true statement, and I can show it to you scripturally all day long. Now, I don't mean every little fear. Please hear me. I don't mean that every little fear is the opposite of faith. You know, when Melissa and I first got married, I worked for an alarm company, Global Alarm. And my job was to go up in the attics and under the houses and run the wires, get the wires to the windows and doors where they needed to go so the alarm would work and all that stuff, okay? Dude, the things that you find in those spaces, rats, snakes, scorpions, spiders, wasps, bugs, skunks. <laughs> I'm telling you, that job stunk. <laughs> some of you heard spiders. I mean, I'm listening to this. Some of you heard spiders and you like about fainted, right? Okay. There are fears and there are phobias that all of us have or have had at some point in our life, but that's not what I'm talking about. Okay. Please Please dial in and hear what I'm saying. I'm talking about fears that have the ability to debilitate us, to make us think things or do things or cause us to make decisions that completely leave God out of the equation. I've known these types of fears. So have you. You're listening. You're watching right now. And instantly certain fears popped into your head that have debilitated you in the past. But have you ever noticed that it's rarely the thing itself that terrifies us? I want you to turn to Mark chapter 4. We're going to be in Mark chapter 4 quite a bit tonight. So go ahead and turn there. I'm going to go ahead and start reading starting in verse 35. Mark chapter 4, starting in verse 35. It says, On the same day when evening had come, he said to them, Let us cross over. To the other side. Now, let me just pause really quick and, and, and say that I, I, am, I read this and I immediately think there is some sort of end times encouragement in this. Some sort of end times empowerment in this story, this passage of scripture. That when it says, let us cross over to the other side. Where have we heard that before? It's a phrase that we use when people die. Right? We understand that our time on this earth, in this realm, will one day come to an end. And we will cross over <laughs> to the other side. We will enter into eternity. Okay, These guys were just going to cross over to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, to the country of the Gadarenes. And if you know the story, Jesus was, was only going over there to deliver one man who was possessed by thousands of of demons, possibly one of the most, um, most possessed men maybe that had ever even lived. Jesus was going to take this long trip across the water, heal him, and then come right back over. That was his plan. That's how much, listen, that's how much Jesus loves us. That's how much he wants someone's safety. I want you to keep that in mind. 
Verse 36 says, Now when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was, and other little boats were also with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that it was already filling up. But he was in the stern, asleep on a pillow. I love that. Jesus is asleep on a pillow. And they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Now i got to ask you, do you think that the disciples would have reacted that way if they had been standing on the shore? Probably not. They probably would have been watching the storm, even admiring it, like the beauty of the lightning and the power of the thunder, and be like, man, isn't this cool? Isn't God awesome? Isn't God? Whatever. They would have thought maybe it was beautiful. Storms are fascinating to watch, right? What made them freak out? Their personal safety was threatened. The boat was filling up with water. (laughs) They thought they were about to drown. On the shore, they could have enjoyed the view for a while and then just gone inside in the safety of their home. But out there in the middle of the water, there was nowhere to go. In other words, they weren't scared of the storm. They were scared of what the storm might do to them. Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? (laughs) Of course he cares. And we know Jesus, right? Jesus stood up, told the storm to shut up, and it says that the wind ceased and there was a great calm. And then he turned to his disciples and said, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? You got to get this, okay? These men had faith, right? Right? They'd left their families. They'd left their jobs. They believed Jesus was the Messiah and had left everything to follow him. They'd already seen him perform miracles and heal people and even cast out demons. They had faith. They had, these guys had faith. But their faith had been negatively affected by fear. Think about it. They were in the boat with the Son of God who came to this earth, who entered into this realm because he loves us, <laughs> because he's not willing that anyone should perish. We know this. They knew this. They had heard Jesus proclaim this. But in a moment when their personal safety was threatened, their fear canceled out their faith. And all they could do was proclaim Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? You know, some scholars believe that that storm was actually an attack from Satan because he didn't want the man he was controlling with demons to be delivered by Jesus. And that may, that may very well be um, because we know that, like we said, our personal sense of safety is one of Satan's most effective snares. But think about the things that that God has called you to. I'll just pause and make it personal real quick. Think about the things that God has called you to and your family to that have only ever required great faith. But in recent weeks, in recent weeks, things that have been canceled out by fear. I don't know what God's been calling you to the other side of in your life, but I can promise you the enemy is trying to keep you from it. Not just in this season, not just in COVID-19 season, in every season. You know what the disciples had forgotten that night in the boat? Philippians 4, 6, the Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer In supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. Jesus was in the boat. He was with them in the storm. But they they didn't pray. They didn't make supplication. You know what supplication is? Supplication means to plead humbly. Okay, to plead with humility. Supplication is prayer with the posture 
of kneeling or bending. Instead of kneeling down, instead of bending down to where Jesus was and sleep on that pillow and being like, Jesus, man, I hate to wake you. I know you're asleep, but there's a storm brewing and it's getting bad. The lightning's beautiful and we've watched it, but now we're a little concerned. It's getting close and uh, the water's starting to fill the boat. We just wanted to see, since you were able to um, part the Red Sea, would you be willing to silence this one? <laughs> but they didn't do that. There was no supplication. There was only accusation, right? Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? This is another clue that, that the enemy was powerfully on the scene because the spirit of accusation, listen, accusation is Satan's song, always. Okay, accusation is Satan's jam. That's his thing. Jesus' disciples did not bow in humility. In fact, they just stood there, even over him, with hostility. Now, why is that? Because of their anxiety. Which leads me to my second point. Write this down. Anxiety is a manifestation of mistrust. Anxiety is a manifestation. Manifestation just means uh, to show up or to be revealed or to, to, show, to show itself, okay? Anxiety shows itself when mistrust is in the mix. Let's look again really quick at Proverbs 29, verse 25. It says, the fear of man brings a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord shall be safe. Okay, the fear of man... The fear of man in context in this verse is talking about fearing man, like caring what people think, being and doing for the sake of uh, public opinion, right? But I want you to read that verse this way, okay? A man's fear, a man's fear brings a snare, okay? Any fear that we have can become a snare, if I'm afraid of being poor, I might become someone who is a workaholic. Okay, I'm snared into becoming a workaholic. If I am afraid of if I'm afraid of failure, I might be tempted to lie and cheat and deceive and manipulate. If I'm afraid of rejection, then the person that God's called me to be is put in a cage. Why? Because what if people don't like the real me? And I've heard that statement many times from people in times of counseling and encouragement. What if, what if people don't like, but what if they don't like the real me? And you see how important it is to trust in the Lord. When we don't, we become anxious about things that we shouldn't be. And before we realize it, we have sold out to the very things that we've been trying to keep out. Let's go ahead and move to my third point for the sake of time. Number three, to trust is to relinquish control. Okay, isn't it true that we feel most insecure, most unsafe, when things are out of control. <laughs> a lack of control is almost always the source of our anxiety. In Matthew chapter 6, um, go back and read it, but Jesus gives the cure for anxiety. Go read it. In verse 27, it says, Who of you, by being worried, can add a single hour to his life? A few verses later, in verse 33, he says, Seek first the kingdom. And his righteous and all these other things will be added to you. All these things that you're so concerned about are going to work out. Listen, we trust what we believe is in control or what's under control. 
If we believe God is in control, we'll trust him and we will seek him first and foremost and go wherever, wherever it is that he leads us. We'll do whatever he tells us to do. But if we don't believe God is in control, then our hearts and our minds are going to cling to whatever it is that we believe is in control because our souls are desperate for safety. That's why there's such a, this is such a dangerous season right now. It's a very dangerous and concerning season of history right now. Safety is about control. Don't let anyone tell you, not for a minute, that what's going on in the world right now isn't about control. It is. The enemy always works in counterfeit. Remember what we said, while people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come upon them. The enemy always works in counterfeits. Think about it. God promises salvation to those who uh, relinquish control of their lives to him, okay, and put their faith in him. He provides peace and safety, and there's never a catch. <laughs> there's not a catch with Jesus. Our salvation, our well-being is his only motivation, right? Well, our enemy will also promise safety and will require us to relinquish control. But he has ulterior motives. Let me give you an enemy at the end example. In Revelation 13, Revelation 13, it tells us that there will come a day when a man will rise up and he's going to mesmerize the world with his miracles. Okay, he is going to uh, have solutions for peace and safety. Verse 3, Revelation 3, verse 3, 13, verse 3, says that the whole earth was amazed and followed after this man. Right here, it calls him the beast. The whole world is amazed and follows after the beast. Okay, but at some point in verse 6, it says that he's going to open his mouth in blasphemies against God. He's going to blasphemy God's name. I believe that this is the revealing of the man of lawlessness that Paul talks about in 2 Thessalonians. In verse 15, if you keep reading, it says that this guy, the beast, causes as many as do not worship his image to be killed. And he causes all, the small and the great, the rich and the poor, the free man and the slaves, to be given a mark on their right hand or on their forehead. And he provides that no one will be able to buy or to sell except the one who has the mark. <laughs> Talk about control, right? Now listen, I know that Satan is powerful, but he always works through men, always. He always works through men, okay? Yes, this is the Antichrist, and in Revelation 13, this, is, this guy you know, is a little different here. He's the Antichrist, but he's just a man that is possessed by Satan. That's why Paul was able to say way back then that the man of lawless or, or the spirit of Antichrist is already at work. Okay, what's my point? Listen to me. One man against the world? Really? Really? One man against the entire world. That should be a landslide. There's no way one man could all of a sudden control the entire world. For one man or organization or government or system to be able to pull the trigger on such worldwide control would require a slow and strategic approach. Maybe something like this. Step one, take advantage of or even create small problems that threaten safety. Step two, present solution to those problems 
that will ensure safety. Step three, encase those solutions inside of new tactics and technologies that will require the relinquishing of levels of control. Repeat. And repeat again. And repeat again. Each time requiring, requi requiring a little more relinquishing of control. Watch for it. Watch for it. It's right around the corner. And maybe even closer than that. Now, do we have to be afraid? No way. We don't have to be afraid. We just have to be awake. We just have to be people with eyes wide open. Down in verse 18 of Revelation 13, it says, here is wisdom. I love this. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast. For the number is that of a man, and his number is 666. The famous 666, okay? But did you hear that? The Bible says that we have the ability to discern such a plot. And listen, I... If we know, thanks to biblical prophecy, that one day an evil man causes as many as do not worship his image to be killed, and that he makes everyone take a mark on their right hand or their forehead so that they will not be able to buy or sell except the one that has the mark, then anything that resembles this, any request for us to relinquish levels of control, any solution presented to us in the name of safety should be on our radar. That's why it's important for us to know the answer to our original question. I feel safest when? When what? Can you answer that question? I feel safest when? And I just want to tell you, if your answer to that question is not, I feel safest when I am submitted to Jesus. I feel safest when I am in the safe care of Jesus. When I am consistently in his word. When I am obeying every chance I get. When I am submitted to the Lord Jesus Christ. If that's not your answer, I hate to say it, but you're vulnerable. You are susceptible to deception. Now, you may be hearing that, and you're like, oh, goodness, okay, what do I do? Man, I'll be honest. It's easy. It's easy. Kneel down. Tap Jesus on the shoulder. Tell him about your storm. And ask him for help. He's nearer to you than anyone else. He's not willing for you to perish. He has the ability to speak peace to your storm. Jesus is literally the only one that you can trust. Relinquish control to him. Proverbs 18, verse 10, and, and a few minutes ago I mentioned verse 11 too, so I want to read both now. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to it and are safe. And verse 11 says, A rich man's wealth is his fortified city. It is like a high wall in his imagination. <laughs> Anything else we've looked to for safety and security is a counterfeit. I want to encourage you if you're listening tonight. Run to the real deal. Run to that strong tower, the name of the Lord. Run to Jesus. Put your faith in him. And you may, you may never have done that before. You've been to church. You've heard some of what I'm talking about. You've heard about the love of Jesus. You've heard about salvation and being born again and these words that are so familiar in the church world, but you have never actually made that personal, conscious decision to put your trust 
in Jesus, to relinquish control to him. Man, now is as good a time as any. Like right where you're at, say out loud, I put my trust in you, Jesus. I forsake all counterfeits, the things that I've looked to for my personal safety, the things that I've looked to and put my security in. And the list is is probably as long as mine. But if you've never made that conscious decision, do that now. In fact, there's going to be something that pops on the, up on the screen. It may have already popped up up there. And it says, I commit my life to Jesus. And if you're hearing this and, and you're like, I'm, I'm ready to get serious about this. Then what you can do is just tap the um, raise hand button. It's a virtual, that's me. That's a virtual standing up and say, I'm, I'm ready. Click that. And when you do, there will be an option for you to, to go and pray with someone if you want to do that. But now is a great time to make that decision to, to open your eyes and see that Jesus is the only safe place. His only motivation is your well-being. Let me end with this. If Satan is preparing his great deception, and he is, I don't, I don't know if you're hearing me and others who are, who are saying similar things and you think this is all in the realm of conspiracy theory. It's not. This is straight up biblical theology. I, like I said, we don't know all the things that are going to happen in the end times and all the little minute things that the enemy is going to do to work towards his great deception. But we know there's going to be a great deception. And we've been given clues as to what to watch and look for and discern and the ability to understand those and not fall for it. Satan is preparing his great deception. Okay, so if Satan is preparing his great deception then we should be preparing the next generation. Because the reality is, is all these things may not happen for, for 5, 10, 20 years. The things that we read about here in Revelations, Revel- the book of Revelation, that may not happen for, for a good while, which means that our kids could be the ones that go through this. Our kids are the ones vulnerable to such a deception, vulnerable to the evil, the man of lawlessness, the system that is already at work in this age. Our, our children, everything, what am I trying to tell you? Everything that we are and do right now prepares our children to have eyes wide open throughout the course of their life and to have the ability to, um, to be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his mind. You know, back to this place here in Mark, I saw something as I was reading this that I've never seen before. I, I've read this and, and even taught out of this text many times. I've never seen this before for some reason, but I saw it this week. In verse 36, remember it says they got in the boat. When they had left the multitude, they took Jesus along in the boat as he was. They took Jesus out in the boat. And look what it says next. And other little boats were also with him. And a great windstorm arose. And as soon as I read that about all the other little boats, it made me think of the next generation. It made me think of my three boys and my daughter. I started seeing some of, some of your children's faces and thinking, what what are they going to fall for? What will they fall for? And I, I'm just, I'm telling you these things, and I could tell you a lot more, and next week I will tell you more. Because I want to encourage you. I care about you. I care about your children. You may be watching, and you're not even really a part of Soma Church. You live in a, another town or another state, or, or someone that you know goes to Soma, and they invited you to watch. I care about you, too. You're part of the body of Christ. God loves you. He's not willing that you perish. We've got to wake up and open our eyes.
And we've got a people who pray and make supplication with thanksgiving, making our request known to God. What I want to do is I want us to close by praying over ourselves and specifically over our children, asking God's provision and protection for them in this crazy season of history. And what I want you to do, just where you're at, is, is take some sort of posture of humility. I'm not saying that you got to bend down or bow down or get on the floor or go lay on a pillow or anything like that, but some sort of posture of humility, even if you're just closing your eyes. If you have um, access, close access to your kids, if they might be off um, doing some of the Soma Kids lessons that uh, Stephanie and Tammy have sent out for you. But if they are near, Put your hand on one of your children. And all I ask is that you agree with me in prayer by saying amen. If you want to say amen 10,000 times while I'm praying, you're welcome to. Amen just means I agree. Yes, Lord, may it be. Let it be done as you've said. Amen. So I'm going to pray. You begin saying amen. And the worship team is actually going to come back and lead us in a time of, of worship to where we can take all these things that we've heard and learned tonight and, and put them into a bundle of joy, a bundle of worship, and offer them right back up to the Lord. Okay, so Lord, we just say, say thank you that you are so attentive. We say that we love you and we worship you and we're grateful for your salvation. We are grateful for the peace and the safety that you provide. Lord, we are so very aware of the enemy that hates us because he hates you and is working against you and against us. And so right now we pray protection over our homes, over our family, over our children. We pray that you would open our eyes Lord, that our greatest desire would be the remnant that you will have upon this earth of those who believe. Lord, give us wisdom, discernment, understanding as we read your word. May they not just be ink on pages, but may your Holy Spirit bring those words to life. Make these, these one-dimensional words three-dimensional, even four-dimensional, Lord. Right now, as we have our hands on our children, we, we ask that you would bless them, Lord, and keep them and make your face to shine upon them and bring them peace, Lord, and keep them in perfect peace with your love, with your word, by your spirit. We close out this time tonight by saying amen and amen. Yes and amen to your word, to your salvation, to your Holy Spirit. Lord, let us not be people riddled with fear, controlled by fear, but standing firm in our faith strong in the Lord and in the strength of his mind. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. I've enjoyed sharing the word with you tonight. I pray that you would take these scriptures and for yourself, go and look. Go and, and read and begin, like he says, uh, let him who has wisdom understand. You have the ability to do that. So go in peace. Go read God's word. God bless.